Well, I, I do want to tell you that I am not the uh, numbers person in our uh, AD suite. That would be DeVos. Um, he's brilliant as a strategist and a visionary. I was a journalism major at Kent State University. I dreamed of writing for Sports Illustrated. Never thought I would have a career actually in intercollegiate athletics, but um, very pleased and proud uh, to have been able to stay in it and to have certainly uh, found a spot where I could work at the University of Texas. I wake up every day and I'm just so honored and uh, proud to be a part of this great university. There's no place like it. I've worked all over the country. I'm not from here. I'm from Western Pennsylvania, Northeast Ohio. Um, and it is uh, just amazing to me as I travel and speak with my colleagues how much awe, uh, respect, and honor uh, is afforded our great, great university, not just for academics, but in all the things uh, that the University of Texas represents. So um, in asking, uh, being asked to speak here, um, you know, there are lots of auxiliary operations on campus. And um, in fact, I had to go through our financial sheets and um, auxiliary, sometimes, see those, that I, L, I, sometimes they stick two L's in there. It's a tough word to spell. So I was a spelling bee kid when I was in sixth grade. So that was one of the first words I, I learned to, to spell. But we are a big auxiliary on campus. Um, and I just thought I'd throw in the big part just because everybody says how big or, you know, what is an auxiliary. But what auxiliary means on this campus is you pay your own bills. And there are lots of examples of auxiliaries. Next slide. Um, recreational sports, again, intramurals, um, again, a function on campus that serves the students. Um, I, I think we have 39,000 undergrads now, and I guarantee you every single one of them finds something to play um, in a club sport or in intramurals. But it is an auxiliary. That means it has to self-fund pay its own bills, and they do that with it one, in part through a required student fee, but just like us, they do a little philanthropic work. They bond facilities and do other things. Parking and traffic, if you think athletics has power, we don't. That's where the God badges are right there. <laughs> I don't, whoever controls parking on campus, they have the, the fittest muscles, for sure. But again, parking and traffic, if they're gonna build a garage, uh, again, what we pay to park on campus, there's a reason for that. Um, I think that garage over on Trinity and San Jacinto was a $22 million garage. Now, you divide that per space. I was looking for the gold linings and the stripes, you know, when you pull in. Very expensive project. And then our Frank Irwin Center, um, which uh, years ago uh, fell under the umbrella of the vice president for business operations on campus. At the time, it was maybe a $9 million auxiliary budget. It's now up to about $16 million. Athletics assumed that building around 2001, so it is now a separate budget under our budget, but it is within intercollegiate athletics. So the Frank Irwin Center, our multi-purpose facility, a beautiful facility, probably ranked as the best on-campus facility in the world, truly, competes at the highest levels with all arenas in this country and others. Uh, John Graham is the director, does a magnificent job. Um, next slide. Um, but I, I want to start with this slide because despite the fact that this, the year that we're in, 2012-13, um, we have a 163-ish million dollar budget for intercollegiate athletics. This slide here and all these numerals are not dollars. These are people. These are kids. Freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, fifth years. And I'm going to take you back 20 years because in this far left column, um, John referred to some things that we had to do to begin to fund a modern intercollegiate athletic program. And where were we in 1992-93? We were still in the Southwest Conference. Uh, Arkansas had just left this league. There, was, there were plates being shifted all over the country. I uh, came here in 93 again. I'd spent a few years here as a publicist in the early 80s. Returned to Texas at DeLoss's call in 1993. When I was leaving the Big East Conference office where I was working, we were having just added Miami. The ACC had just added Florida State. Uh, Arkansas and South Carolina went to the SEC. And you know what's happened to all those leagues today. It's just unbelievable that even 20 years ago when it first started, it's still shifting. But 1992-93 was a benchmark year here at UT. It's hard to see because we had 427 
men and women competing in our sports, and at the time we had 17 sports. And that percentage of 76.3 for men, again, that's participation numbers, and 23.7% for women caused a plate shift down here. And that plate shift was six undergraduate women students who are on the rec sports soccer team came to the administration and said, we believe there are not enough women's athletics opportunities at varsity level. We think we should be a varsity team. And it was that ratio right there that caused that suit to be taken and a year later settled. And the reason the numbers are significant, because I have 11, 12 numbers here, we're now at 49.8% men, 50% women. It's basically 50-50. We had to get to a ratio of equity within a certain number of percentage points based on a settlement of May of 1993 which again happened about five months before I came back to UT. But it was that requirement to add three sports in a four-year period at the time the Southwest Conference was in a real down period. The, the conference was being dwarfed by other strong leagues like the Big Ten, the SEC, the ACC, who were all expanding. Texas had to do something business-wise to continue its efforts in intercollegiate athletics. And, and the three sports that we immediately set out to add based on that settlement were soccer, softball, rowing, no facilities, no coaches, no scholarships, no anything from scratch. The hardest endeavor you could imagine in sport with tight budgets, tight time frames, and your conference not throwing off a lot of money in addition to everything you're raising on campus through ticket sales and fundraising. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what we did, we added three sports, and we went out to you, frankly. DeLoss asked me to come back in 1993. He said, you, you've been here before. You worked in women's athletics as a publicist. We're going to get together with women's athletics. Jody Conrad was the women's AD at the time. They said, let's get together and do some business. And what we needed to do first, and we knew it, because by January of 1994, we had announced that we were going to the Big 12, and we had two and a half years to get ready for it. The very first thing we did is we looked at our facilities, and the reason I put up bonded uh, or our debt service right now, um, and it's what we owe from here out, we had to spend money on facilities. We were so behind on our facilities. I don't think um, Memorial Stadium, Texas Memorial Stadium at the, at the time had been touched since they put the upper deck on, really. So we began to pour money into our facilities, meaning we had to go out and raise some money in gifts, and then we had to bond the rest and create revenue opportunities. You might be intimidated in a $163 million budget that we have a debt service this year of $18,284,357, but I can tell you that the north end zone alone, which was the last project we did out of the $450 million, spins off $12 million over what we owe in debt every year. So I'm going to step back for a moment and tell you that DeLos Dodds' most visionary moment, uh, back when times were thin and tough and we had to add a lot of sports, a lot of opportunities, and fix our facilities, is you could decide that you depend on your usual revenue streams, ticket sales, fundraising, a little bit of money from the conference, a little bit of money from the NCAA, or you could go to work yourself and really change the model. And what he believed then and what was true is that eventually even, even the greatest of gifts that we get, which are endowments, spin off only so much revenue that we can then put back into operations. What we had to do is to figure out how to make a lot of money that would sustain our operation and allow us to continue to build things and keep things going. And so what we did is we created premium seating suites, clubs, and the things that you might view as commercialized, very much like pro environments. But I promise you, the reason that we exist today and are healthier financially than we've ever been before is because that decision was made back in 94, 95. Um, I think we went to five people and asked them for an original seat of $15 million to help name the stadium after Coach Royal, God rest his soul. That was a sort of a spear in the ground of our uh, perpetuation in terms of 
high side fundraising and that we were going to build, rebuild, if you will, bit by bit our stadium to begin to create a product that would not only help us financially, but, but create a better environment for our fans who were already paying a high dollar ticket to enjoy a better stadium experience. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, these figures, if you can look at your screens, again, this is where we spend our money. And I gave you, the, again, that chart of young people, men and women first, because we have 550 or so now. We spend everything we have almost, either on facilities, which are where our kids train, compete, and where you come to watch them. And by the way, nothing is more meaningful to those 550 young people than for you to watch them, advocate for them, cheer them on, and eventually help them when they've got that really coveted degree to be a marketable citizen. But when you look at these areas, um, here, here's our revenues and where we make them, okay? You can see football carries the day. 85%, 90% of our revenues in some way, shape, or form are attributed to football. Every Division I school in the country will tell you that, and if they don't, they're fibbing somewhere. Um, it is just the economic engine for us. Um, the, uh, we get a little bit for guarantees, but you can see fundraising. Um, I think we were making around $12 million back in 1993. You see the Longhorn Foundation, that's our giving umbrella, is about $40 million. The Big 12 Conference, if you don't think that it's been a great thing, again, despite some of the changes we've undergone, getting revenue of $21 million a year for 10 schools in our Big 12 Conference is right up there with what all those other larger morphing, continuing to morph leagues are getting. And the news is going to get better because of a new TV contract our conference just signed with ESPN and uh, Fox, and also the new BCS football championship model. Um, the big change that we made also back in addition to creating premium seating, um, the regents between 1993 when we first went to them and said we are finding it impossible to operate in this business environment. I listened to Mr. Tillerson's remarks. Sometimes it's harder to work here than it is overseas. Back in 93, 94, 95, we had no regulations in the UT system board of regents rules that allowed us to go out and to begin to get money from companies be it Chase Bank or HEB or Time Warner or AT&T. They were happy to spend it in sports-related ways. They were spending it on the plethora of pro teams in this state. Because we didn't have rules that allowed the University of Texas as an institution or even with our logo to align with them and to say that we're affiliated with each other in a sponsorship way. By 1997 summer, um, we had some regions that were terrifically helpful for us, people that were in business. I'll name a couple, Don Evans, Tom Hicks, Martha Smiley were regents at that time, helped convince our board that we needed to move in a direction so that we could economically fund the future of intercollegiate athletics. Now, I can tell you that universities are not always set up to do very nimble business in advertising and sponsorship. Media is so complicated and it's rapid. What we did is we farmed that out. We signed a tremendous agreement with an outside company that hires salespeople who are experts. We allowed them to take our inventory. That company today is IMG. It, originally it was Host Communications, but it is the Mark McCormick IMG. They signed a multimedia rights agreement with us in 1998 that is now between trademark and licensing and sponsorship, and those are all those promotions and the signage and the money we get from everything we sell with a trademark is upwards of $30 million a year now. That money back in 1993 was a $600,000, $700,000 line item. So when I tell you how we have totally changed because of the allowances by our regents rules, again, to go out there and to do modern practice business for athletics changed our world. Uh, next slide. Again, this is how we make money. Chris, uh, where does the Longhorn Network come um, it, it falls within that royalty payment, okay. yes. Um, okay, students, student athletic aid, that's our scholarships. Um, we are fully funded for all of our 20 sports. Whatever the NCAA limit is on scholarships, we fully provide those to our teams, partial or full. Um, you can see our salaries for our staff, our coaches, our administrative support staff. But when you get into recruiting, team travel, equipment, game expense, just to run, run the facilities and the operations that we do to upkeep those facilities, 
Um, most of the money, again, that we generate, we have to pour back into what we do for those 550 student athletes. Um, I am, again, a person that every day knows that I come to a place that doesn't exist except for 50,000 students. Why are we here? John and his colleagues are here to educate them. Our staff, 375 people, are there to provide 550 young men and women the opportunity to wear a uniform that says Texas. That's your, that's your brand. They didn't create it. They have an opportunity to represent it. But what we do for them in every dollar we generate is we put back into something that will make them a better student, a better person, a better athlete, and again, ultimately, the day that they can't run, jump, toss a football, run a football, or throw a basket in, in the rim, is they need to be you someday. Because this athletic experience is short-lived. The average life for an NFL player at an elite level is four years. I mean, how many of y'all watched the Super Bowl? We had four young men in there. Again, if Justin Tucker and Shockey and Leonard Davis and Terrell go beyond four, four and a half years, and some of them have, they are an exception, not the rule. Um, you know, the Kevin Durants and, and the Houston Streets, far and few between, less than 2% of all the student athletes in the country who compete in college sports are, are going to make money in that endeavor. What most of them are going to be doing is exactly what we're doing. They're going to be slugging it out in a profession that hopefully we've prepared them for. And what we hope is that this athletic competition experience gives something to them that makes you or whoever you work with or your HR departments want to hire them. They should learn how to play a role within a team. They should learn how to wait, work for a greater good. They should learn great communication skills. They have to have integrity. They have to have honesty. They have to put themselves below something that is, again, more important than themselves. That is what sport is supposed to do. We love to light the tower. Wins, you know, we're judged on wins and losses. I promise you, our volleyball team this year, we thought they could win it. The 2009 team was far more talented. But what this group had was leadership. Our young ladies have been, they were so to the well so many times. And again, I know y'all got nervous against Michigan because I was under the table by that point. Um, <laughs> But I looked at that group, and I, they were different. When they came out for game three, and we were down one, to two, or game four, and we were down two to one, there was just a different look. And the look that I saw was on our fifth year senior, Bailey Webster, who's, she's going to be a senior this year. She graduated in December. This team started last year when we lost to UCLA in Lexington, Kentucky, and she didn't let anybody come out of the locker room. The trainer came out, and we said, where's the team? And she said, Bailey's in there telling them about what we're doing next year. That's where that team began to its championship run. If, you, if Bailey Weather, Webster would walk in this room, she's 6'4", beautiful, articulate, self-confident, smart. Um, Y'all, somebody better hire her after she's done playing. Uh, because she is an asset, not just to us, but to her team and to our university. Bailey Webster will do whatever she wants to do in life because of what she's been prepared for. So again, she's just one of the 550 that we spend these inordinate, in some people's minds, dollars on. But I promise you, the most important dollars, besides the ones that allow them to compete, it is their love. They have that skill. They have their talent. Mr. Tillerson was in the band. That's a talent, a skill. These young men and women, they are physically elite athletes. It's what they love. It's their passion. But the most important dollars that we spend besides allowing them to do that are in our student services area, our sports medicine area to keep them healthy, teach them about good nutrition, good diet, stay away from junk, so that someday when their parents are going to teach their kids the same thing. We should have a healthier group of young people by just all the parents who have been student athletes in this country because they sure have been told how to stay healthy. Next slide. Um, this is sort of a, a snapshot picture of operating accounts, just so you see big numbers. And again, I told you our combined men and women's athletics budget back in 1993 was $23 million. 23. Right now, our cash reserve is $43 million. And that is, again, that's our nest egg. Just like a business, we've got to have a reserve. And 
Every day we work to be sure that we're financially secure because every figure that you see on this slide is self-generated. Um, the other pieces of our dollars, just so you know, and I'm glad John mentioned it, we do give an awful lot back to campus. And in the 11-12 budget year alone, which is this budget, we gave about $7.9 million to campus. And that includes half of the Longhorn Network rights fee. For the first five years minimum, half of that network money goes right to campus. And I believe Bill uh, Powers and his staff have created at least seven academic chairs just with that network money alone. The other dollars we share are a minimum of 10% or a million dollars of our trademark and licensing money per year. It goes over there. And then the other, there are some other dollars I'm going to show you in a minute. But the other things I want to tell you is we are part of campus. All of this budget is not outside. There are some athletic departments in this country that are incorporated like businesses, Florida and Kansas to name two. Everything we do goes through our university budgeting system. Everything is transparent. People can see where we spend and take every dollar. We are part of the university's budget. And with that, if we have young people staying in the dorms, we pay the dorm rate. If we uh, do a transaction on campus, we pay the same 3.75% transaction fee that every other unit on campus has to. We pay for parking. Um, whoever's a Longhorn Foundation member in this room and you get a parking pass, part of your annual gift is going to offset some of the parking fees that we pay. We pay parking, I think, over a million dollars a year. Whatever the Longhorn Band does, football band, we fund every cent of what they do in terms of what they do for football and basketball and the others. So we're helping quite a bit. Uh, next slide. Uh, one more. I'm going to skip that one because it's the same thing. Um, this is another example of how we help uh, campus. The University of Texas Dining Club, which opened in 1998, again, another one of those facility dreams. Let's put some club seats out there and a club for game day. And we said, what are we going to do with it the other 360 days a year? We created the UT Club. And as part of that contract with Club Corp, uh, Robert Dedman's group at the time, um, we said we're going to give uh, some money back to the UT libraries, where you can see annually what those dollars are now. And those dollars have been hiked a little bit because our students this year came and wanted 24-7 open service in the library right here. They didn't want it to close at night. They needed about $40,000 more per year in order to do that. And we, we were able to make that transaction happen in an agreement between DeLoss and Bill Powers. And these dollars, again, go out through 2022, but it doesn't include about a half million dollars between 1998 and 2011 that was generated for the library. So we don't want you to think that when there is an issue on campus or a project on campus that if Bill or anybody else calls, that we, that we don't want to be supportive of. And this is just one example of that. Um, the other things I think you, you probably um, ought to know is that we, uh, we have, um, again, the, a network. Um, you ask why, because not all of you can see it. Um, but I promise you, um, television, like facilities, like sponsorship and media was one of those things back in 1993 we were talking about saying, where is it going? Where will television be in 10 to 20 years? Um, we got a little inspiration from the Big Ten Conference, which in 2008 launched its own network for a conference. Um, and again, I kind of grew up in that area of the country. And I, we looked at that. And Dawson and I talked to a lot of consultants. And uh, he said, you know, Chris, I don't know if if uh, Nebraska fans really want to watch something involving Penn State, unless Nebraska and Penn State are playing with each other. He said, what if a network was about a school? And Notre Dame had started that little trend with its NBC deal back for all of its home games on NBC. So we tried to follow that train. And for about five years, no one talked to us. Everybody from Fox to ESPN ignored us. And then. Um, that conference plate shifting started to happen again in summer of 2010. And when it became readily apparent to every media agency in the country that every conference, regardless of geography, would love to have Texas even talking with it if the Big 12 was going to break up, Fox came in and offered us a very handsome deal. I mean, a very handsome deal. It was probably a $5 million or so rights fee over the life of a 20-year period. And then ESPN came in 
and just said, we want to be with you. We want you to stay in the Big 12. We think you're an asset to our company. You've been an asset to every conference you've been in. Wherever you go, we want you to be our partner. And they placed a 20-year, $300 million deal on the table to create a brand opportunity for Texas. And it's just like the Oprah channel. I mean, who was more watched than Oprah? Oprah decided to take her syndicated show off of free, what people perceived as free TV, and go to a cable channel. She is struggling, as big as Oprah is, to get cleared. Well, that's what a new channel goes through. But if we're going to go into the TV business, I'd rather be with Walt Disney Company and ESPN than any other agency because they have more power and more reach. Every one of us, if we have cable or satellite, are paying at least almost $6 a month just to get anything that is Disney and ESPN related. Yeah. They are just the big McGill in the room. We're proud of what they've done. They've got 88 employees over there. The studio is beautiful. Um, the academic program they've done is stunning. It will continue. And to that point, this was an entrepreneurial decision that Bill Powers allowed athletics to lead to create an asset for our university that not only would result in financial gain, but it would, it would be a representation with a great company that is proud to affiliate with us. When we are fully distributed, and we will be, it's just a matter of time, this will be the most unique brand opportunity and PR vehicle that, of any institution in the land. And I promise you, anybody that has watched it or has it, I think you can speak to the quality. Um, next slide. Game changers. Um, I told you in 1993, uh, the lawsuit settlement was a game changer. In 1972, Title IX was a game changer for athletics. Uh, the Department of Education made a little announcement about three weeks ago that could be another game changer for publicly funded, federally funded agencies who offer sports because disabled athletes are able to get now equitable opportunities as well. Originally, this article uh, came out referred to K through 12, um, you know, grade schools, junior highs, high schools that offer sports that they have to make accommodations for disabled youngsters that want to compete. Where that will take us, we don't know. But I imagine the reaction based on the media accounts and the radio shows that I listened to that day, um, a lot of public school ADs and administrators were a little bit nervous about how are we going to accommodate this new option or this new requirement. Um, I think that's what ADs were doing in 1972 when Title IX passed. Now we have to fund women's athletics. It was what everybody was doing in the 90s when, again, Title IX continued to burn and you reinforce, provide equitable opportunities. This may be the next frontier. And eventually, I believe this probably will reach higher education. The good news on our campus is our facilities, not only for intramurals and rec sports, are so modern. I think we can, we can satisfy anyone's need uh, and hunger for competition, be it at the varsity level or in a recreational way. So again, um, what I want to tell you is we um, are very, very proud, number one, that we have been fiscally responsible. Our theme at UT Athletics is winning with integrity. We want to win in every way. All 20 of those coaches uh, and those teams want to. We're not going to cheat to do it. Um, we're having a rough year. We've been there. We've done it. We'll rebound. Um, we believe that we're doing things the right way. Things run cyclically sometimes in competition. But what we can promise you is you, we want to operate in a way that will never put a burden on our academic or presidential area that he is worried every day about what athletics is doing financially. I think the decisions we made with, again, regental, administrative, and fan support 20, 25 years ago were critical to where we are today. Had we not done the things we did in the 90s, I would not be standing here talking to you, and very likely we would not have a Big 12 conference or be as healthy as we are. Um, we're proud that we added opportunities without cutting. A lot of schools across the country have to cut men's sports in that order to add women's sports. That doesn't make anybody feel good either. Uh, but I promise you, we're going to get our competition um, mojo back. Uh, you're going to be proud of the way our kids compete. And I think uh, this past semester, we were just under a 3-0 aggregate for all 20 of our sports. And uh, so we're competing very well in a classroom too. 
Um, that volleyball team had a 3.22 GPA too. So like I said, I loved lighting that tower, but when I got their grades, I turned two more you know, spins in, in the desk chair because that's, a, that's the kind of story we want to tell you and be proud of. So I'll halt for a minute. Uh, again, that's our financial picture, and I do hope every time you see a dollar, you think about us helping a young person. Yes? Uh, it was, it's an accurate statement. Remember when I told you that no one was listening to us and for a four to five year period? One of those notions that crossed our mind is maybe we're not big enough to have our own channel and maybe we need to have a partner uh, because at the same time, Oklahoma was thinking about a network as well. So what better you know, partner would be A&M? And we called and we asked them if they wanted to think about it and they preferred not to pursue. Again, I think that there's some uh, value and understanding to that decision. It was Bill Byrne at the time, and I respect Bill. Bill's a marketing maverick. I think he just felt a little bit of doubt that any entity would step up and fund any institutionally branded network. Um, so A&M went in a different direction and made a different decision. I respect them. They've had a heck of a year. And uh, again, I, I wish him well in that league. Um, again, I, from a student athlete welfare standpoint, I'd like to see five years from now how they're feeling about, again, just traveling young people, the distance they have to travel and get back. The other night, you saw our men's basketball team. We lost to West Virginia on the road. They had a bad snowstorm that night. They go out to their plane. The plane door doesn't close. It's frozen. Another hour and a half repair, more snow falls. They got to stay overnight. You get back. Think about that trip for a basketball team about seven or eight times a year. That's the reason we decided to stay in our geographic footprint. We like who we're with. We're proud of our league. We get to play everybody. We think it's manageable from a student athlete's time standpoint. We can get our kids there and back. They don't miss class. Um, that's, that's what we do. Yes? We have always been for paying for cost of attendance. In other words, if uh, there's a federally um, mandated figure for your kids to attend here, what it really costs to go to college between tuition fees, room, book, board, which is all we can offer them. They can apply for a Pell Grant if they're eligible and other financial aid. But what we're for is that cost of attendance figure, which can range at some institutions from $2,000 a year to $4,000 a year. We can afford it, as could every school pretty much in the top five conferences in the country. But what happens is you've got other schools. Think about how large the NCAA is in Division I. Um, we're different than Texas State, who is different than UTSA. They don't have that ready funding for that economics. We cannot ever be pay for play. The day we turn into an employee-employer relationship for them to represent us in competition, tear it all up. It's over. You might as well be watching the mini NFL, the mini MLB, and the mini NBA. That's not where we can go in this environment. This is an extracurricular activity for which students can get financial aid to participate. We are for expanding financial aid to include that cost of attendance, at least Texas is, along with many others. That's what we need to get to. So yes, I think I wouldn't use the word compensation. I would use the word financial aid applicable to their participation opportunity. Yes? Can you give us an update on the possibility of the network being on uh, Time Warner since we can't seem to get it in this area? <laughs> yeah, great question. It's, it's the big four now. It's DISH, who they're talking to now, DirecTV, two satellite carriers. Then we've got Comcast. We still have a little work to do with Comcast and the other big Megilla, Time Warner. Um, if you've ever seen sumo wrestling, Time Warner and ESPN, Disney in the same room, that's what that's going to be. It will be a hard negotiation. Um, we believe we'll get there, but it's, it's not going to be imminent as in tomorrow. But here's how networks get cleared. ESPN has carriage agreements for the channels they already sponsor. When those carriage agreements are approaching their expiration date, both parties will get together. And now ESPN has some things that it can offer these um, uh, carriers. They have channels. They have 
internet, you can you know, watch ESPN on your phone. Not every carrier can offer that service, but if they want it, ESPN is gonna charge them and get from them what they want out of it too. So it's all a function of the negotiation. And like I said, we've got the big four left. We've got Cox and Charter cleared and Cox will be about another 140,000 homes in Dallas. Charter's gonna give us more in some uh, attending states, um, but it's carrier by carrier. And uh, we're, we're gonna get there, but it's gonna be a while for Time Warner. I don't wanna lie to you. One other question. On the network, do the students in communications get an opportunity to work in that? They offer internships, not only in programming and production, but also in advertising. And um, you'd have been really impressed with the spots that were generated by uh, advertising and communication students here at UT that work directly with the ESPN crew. I don't know if you saw the one where the little girls being told the nighttime story, you know, fourth and six. That spot, that script was done by students, and it was a wonderful spot. That's what I mean. We there are so many bright minds in this campus. We want to use them all, but yes, they've created those kind of opportunities. Yes. That's what moves the needle. I mean, when they see people flipping carriers, which is why carrier by carrier, depending on your range. I mean, think about if one of these satellite companies signs on quick. Somebody's gonna have another option if it's offered in your area. So there's no question. I mean, I know a whole bunch of my friends switch to Uverse. Any other questions? Yes. Well, the teaching hospital um, is a game changer and and I promise you from an athletic standpoint our our entire department is ecstatic about that but we know you know it could occur right in that footprint I think the way Austin is growing um, we eventually you know the, the Irwin Center has a lifespan as most buildings do I believe that Austin 10 years from now is going to be the type of city where we're going to probably have to have an arena that is like some others that have been recently built in large cities. There's one in Tulsa that University of Tulsa shares. Um, there's one in Louisville where a volleyball team won the championship. The city uh, has a lease with Louisville for that. Um, one in Omaha, one in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, so I see an arena of the future. I wouldn't call it basketball only because they can't make it if it's not multifunctional for a lot of things, convertible to a lot of things. Uh, but I think the way our city's growing and in order to make room for what our med complex is going to be, we're going to have to look at our entire campus master plan. And I know there are brighter minds than me doing that right now. Anything else? Time for one more question. One more question. If not, we're going to ask Chris to make the drawing for the math round. Football. Sure. Y'all, thank you again for what you do for our young people. <laughs>